Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this Tuesday, March 31st edition of Bang the Book Radio. My name is Adam Burke, your host for the next probably half hour or so as we talk some horse racing with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We're going to go over a little bit of the card for Tampa Bay Downs on uh, Wednesday, April 1st. We're going to break down the program a little bit more for you, break down the form a little bit, finish up that conversation that we started last week uh, with regards to horse racing. Over at bangthebook.com, we're covering college football conference championship odds. Those were posted earlier this week over at Bet Online. We'll be doing a lot of stuff with the NFL draft. I'm still doing the betters box, my MLB betting podcast. Had a new edition of that on Monday. And we'll also update our unsweet 16 bracket where we've got winners for the first round. We'll move on to the round of eight, whatever I'm going to call that, with the worst bad beats of the 2010s in football. That'll be coming your way here over the next day or two over at bangthebook.com. Finally, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest, and we're going to chat some horse racing here today with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam. How are you hanging in there, kiddo? Uh, doing the best I can here, trying to go day by day here, much like everybody else that's out there. And uh, a lot of people out there kind of taking a shine to horse racing now because outside of Ukrainian table tennis and God knows what else, not a whole lot for us to bet on. So I've seen a lot of people getting into the horse racing side of things. We talked a lot of horse racing last week. We'll talk a lot of horse racing here this week as well. But, Brian, what do you think of everybody now kind of gravitating towards this horse racing market? I mean, are they just uh, out to get burned, or is there some chance they can have some success here? Oh, no, I I, I don't think you, you jump into the deep end of the pool and you're firing the gun. Um, I, I think if you're wise about it, if you're really just starting to pay attention to it a little bit, uh, maybe ease your way into it, I, but it would be very interesting to me if we had the same discussion a year from now. Uh, I mean, you know me. I mean, I play horses every day of the year, and I think horse racing in a weird way uh, could prove to be someone uh, that gets some good news as a result of everything we're going through because I think people that never look cross-eyed at horse racing are looking at horse racing and the, the funny thing is, I, I've always said that if, you know, you go to the track and you go down stand at the rail and they go run and buy you once um, or, you know, just had that experience, I, I wouldn't, I never said it would become everybody's passion and favorite thing like it is mine, but they go, hey, that's pretty cool. And it, to me, it's more just somebody sampling it for the first time. And if they're sitting here and have been staring at this now for two, three weeks, I would venture a guess a, a lot of people that in the fall would never have bet a horse race. They're, they're getting ready for college football and an NFL weekend. They might pay attention to what's the big race this Sunday and actually take a look at it. So I wonder if horse racing uh, to a degree, I, I don't know how massive a degree it would be, but I wonder if horse racing actually benefits in that they've developed some new clients and some new fans. And, you know, I worked at a racetrack eons ago, and that back then it was the discussion. How do you get new fans? You know, to, how do you get young people to get, get excited about and pay attention to it early uh, in their walk of life? And that's been the challenge for the sport forever. And here's something where, for the first time, it's the, kind of the only game in town. So maybe they do reap some rewards from it. Yeah, it definitely seems like that's going to be the case here. A lot more interest, a lot more excitement. And, you know, who knows? Maybe that kind of brings about some interesting developments here once we get into the summer and then on into September with the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, we'll see what happens with the Preakness and the Belmont and some of the other prep races that are still yet to come. But, you know, again, like you said, a lot more interest here, and that could make for a pretty interesting Triple Crown year, assuming, of course, that we wind up getting all of those races here. And, of course, depending on, the schedule in which we wind up following. But as far as today goes here, Brian, you know, we talked about a lot of things last week on the show. We talked about a lot of things like looking at bloodline, like looking at jockeys, um, you know, obviously kind of looking at the trainers as well. Some more household names than others. 
We're going to break down race eight at Tampa Bay Downs here on Wednesday, April 1st. This is a one and one sixteenth mile turf race, but we're going to break this one down over at bangthebook.com. I will have a link in the podcast recap to the form that I'm looking at here. Brian's got his trusty daily racing form in front of him, but I'll pass along a link so that you can follow along here with some of the things that we're talking about with regards to race eight here at Tampa Bay Downs. The first thing I want to start with here, Brian, this is labeled as an allowance optional claiming race. One and one sixteenth miles here on the turf. What does that mean, allowance optional claiming? Uh, this is an optional claiming race. So if you were to look at the number one, for example, look at look at the at the one and the two. Uh, the one, number one tabled, and I, I know we've got slightly different things, but do you see a seventy five thousand dollar figure uh, above the horse's weight? You see a uh, on the one table, do you see the the, the number seventy five thousand dollars? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, if you look at the number two, there is no such dollar figure, correct? Correct. Okay. So that means that the number one is entered, and the horse can be claimed for seventy five thousand dollars. Now, uh, the exact conditions of the race. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I, I'm assuming, and I'm assuming that there's a break in weight. That if 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 the horse uh, runs for the seventy five thousand dollar claiming price, the horse is allowed whatever. I don't have, I can't find it here. Allowed two or three or four pounds, and he's running uh, with one hundred eighteen pounds, and the number four horse is running at one hundred twenty pounds. So so there are conditions. That you get a if you say I'm going to put the horse in for a tag, which means it can be claimed, uh, you know you'll get a benefit, a slight benefit uh, against some of the other horses in the race. So the number one technically, as long as the gate springs, the horse can be claimed, and the number two cannot. The two is running as if it were an allowance race. So this one, there's an option to protect the horse or not protect the horse. So that's that would be the condition. So from a handicapping standpoint, does does that really mean anything to us, you know, with regards to this race? I don't see much benefit uh, for it here. In fact, um, uh, real quick, one, two, I only see uh, four. Four of the ten runners uh, are actually entered uh, with the claiming tag on it, uh, you know. So, but but the way the, the way this specific race breaks down, I don't see any significant benefit uh that oh oh yeah this one's in for a tag and they're getting so much because they're putting the horse in for a tag uh I, some of them i think they're saying hey look i just they're they're sitting there some of them in in some races yes the benefit is worth it in this race i would just say uh you know the the trainer of the, the four horses that are in there going please somebody take the horse for seventy five thousand dollars like they, they would, they feel like they'd be winning the lottery if somebody took the horse. They're, they're they're doing it in hopes that someone will take the horse. Then they don't have to feed it and worry about what it turns into. So I guess that's kind of my question: is like sometimes these are more like you know showcase races, and other times they're just kind of like, please take this horse from me. In some instances, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things. No matter like every race, when when we started doing this last week, I mean, jokingly, I mean, you said to me. Today, before we start, okay, well, where did we leave off last week? I'm like, hey, buddy, I said, I don't care where we left off. I mean, we, we could do this for another three weeks and, and keep finding stuff. I mean, the, the, you know, the, you have to be part shrink for every horse race. And you, A, you look at the black and white on print. Then, you, then you're like, what is this trainer trying to do? Um, I know the difference of the, the, the form that we're dealing with. Uh, and this is, in a lot of respects, I love the daily racing form for the information that it it throws in there. Uh, it would give you information on the trainer. And that's a big deal because basically the trainer is the one plopping the horse into a spot where he believes the horse can win. So then you can go and find the historical data of a trainer uh, for example, the number two Bitcoin Passion, who I, I, I think is one of the main contenders in the race, uh, is one for one, only one career race, uh, one at first asking at a mile and a 16th on the turf on January 19th. Well, 
We haven't seen the horse since. So then you go down and look, and the trainer, Chris Clement, is a turf machine. He's one of the incredible world-renowned trainer that's actually got uh, some runners at Tampa Bay. But they have information in the daily racing form that coming off a layoff of 61 to 180 days and 87 races that Clement has done this, he has actually won 15% of the time. Uh, you know, it has his overall record, breaks him down on turf, where he's a 21% trainer on the turf. It has information on him that his horse is in route events, not sprint events. He's an 18% trainer. So, again, when you, you're, you're looking at one horse, there's just so much information to dissect. The other thing um, on your form, if you looked at Bitcoin Passion, we're, we're focused on the number two. If you look at his running line, he came from off the pace and he won. If you look, he was uh, two to one. It was 210. And there's a little asterisk next to the 210, which means he was the favorite in that race. And then it lists the three horses, the top three finishers in that last race, where Bitcoin Passion was the winner. And it's it's condensed and abbreviated because of space. But I it's it says by M Candy. I, I'm a, I would assume it's something like by by my candy, maybe. Uh, is that italicized on your form? Yes. If it's italicized. That means, and this is a big handicapping angle, you know, how good was that last race? Well, the race was good enough that in the next race, the runner-up, by my candy, if italicized, came back to win his next race. That's a very important thing. So you're, cause you're, though, there are other things. I mean, again, Adam, I, I, you know, we're having a little fun horse racing discussion. You, you, I could spout off 50 angles and things that I look for, uh, but one of them, and the gold mine opportunity, uh, and I think with a trained eye and you're watching these things, if you watch a maiden race, and, and I'm, I'm asking you to close your eyes and envision something like this, but they're, uh, a maiden special weight race with a bunch of first-time starters, 10-horse field, um, and you look, and, and the, the horses cost a lot of money, and, and the, the breeding on the horses are all terrific, and then they run the race. And it's, three horses go out, and they're lightning fast, and there's a, 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 a pace battle on the front end where usually horses pack it in. But some of those horses keep going. But then all of a sudden, from mid-pack, here comes a, a stalker, and he's running. And then out of the clouds, here comes a closer. And in that 10-horse field that I'm actually asking you to envision, there's a winner and a couple of horses that, were, that just fought their way through something that most horses would pack it in. And all of a sudden... Five horses are within three lengths of of the the wire at the end, and and you're sitting here and you watch the race and say, man, those five horses, depending if they were racing against somebody else, those horses ran a winning race. Now you sit there and you say, and the, here's the hard part is in your eye, saying, I'm marking that down. That's a key race. It's you call it. It's a key race. And you mark those five horses down. And you just say, that was a key race. I'm convinced all five of those horses are going to come back the next time. And if three, if three or four of them win the next out, it indeed was a key race. But by seeing something like that, just like we do in sports handicap, and you're watching, you're watching the end of a second half of maybe what's a meaningless football game because of fantasy football or something, but you spot something that you can use to bet a team next week it's the same premise in horse racing. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I never knew that about why some of the names were italicized. So I definitely appreciate that little tidbit. Something that can definitely uh, come in handy here, especially if you watch these tracks regularly and you know, have a good idea of who's running and, and where some of these horses wind up being. I want to circle back to Tabled for a second here. The number one horse in this race, the owner is Godolphin. And that's a big name in the horse racing business. How much do you look at ownership when you handicap races? A lot. And it's not something that you go by the boards. And, and oh, by the way, I would even say to you, and you're right. I mean, if you see Godolphin, say, say again, when you're, you're a nut bar like me, oh, Godolphin, the, the royal blue silks. Like, I, I, you know, I know they're silks. Um, 
the the breeding is is through the charts, uh, and 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 they're racing in graded stakes races around the world. A horse like this, this is why this horse is in for seventy five thousand dollars. If this is a mom and pop operation, and this horse came off uh, his maiden win, right? They'd be doing a cartwheel. You know, you look the horse. Three races did nothing, went on the turf and won, and the horse has earned $12,000 in four races. A mom-and-pop organization or, or, or barn would sit there and say, hey, maybe we got something here, and, you know, he's going to be a consistent, steady runner, and, you know, he, he could win a two, three races a year and, and earn a check, and, and it covers the cost of stabling him and feeding him and the whole nine yards, and he's worth the effort. Godolphin is sitting here going, all right, great. The horse just won a maiden claiming race, but the horse won 12 Gs. Godolphin could care less. We got other fish to fry. We got better horses than this. So they plop them down in a claiming race, and they'd be thrilled if somebody took them. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, from the big picture, this horse could be a nice middle-tier $20,000 claimer for the next four years. That's not what Godolphin's about. Godolphin's about, you know, big races. So if you, I mean, I'm honestly just looking at it. I mean, oh yeah, there's, there's why put them in for a tag. Cause it's Godolphin. They got, they don't, they don't please somebody here. If you want the horse, take the horse. So that's kind of something that I, I was sort of looking at here is that, you know, this is a Godolphin horse that they're trying to move, you know, in other races, if Godolphin owns the horse and they're not putting it up for a claiming, does that mean that they just have a higher opinion of it? Yeah, I think in in large regard, that's what's going on here. I mean, they're just like you know, Michael Stidham's a terrific trainer, thirty percent guy. He's got great horses in his barn, um, you know, and not to diminish this this animal, but I mean, you know, someone could take this horse. And I I I highly doubt it, but if someone, I mean, the next race, you know, we'll see how he runs now against winners, and, and if he gets throttled in this race, trust me. You know, the next time you see this horse, he's in for a $20,000 tag. And they're like, take the horse. You know what I mean? Because if I'm looking at this horse, could he develop into something uh, really well-bred? I mean, but could he develop into something down the road? Yeah, but what's the ceiling? The ceiling may be, uh, you know, that this is a horse that races at parks or Delaware Park. Uh, you know, maybe you send him out to Golden Gate. You know, he's not good enough to race Santa Anita. You send him to the Northern California circuit. And the horse would be a grinder. A grinder and churn out some money for you, and for a smaller barn, it's worth the it's worth it. It's not worth it for a smaller barn to spend seventy five thousand potatoes on this one, but the day will come someone could take the horse. But Godolphin is not in the business of running around win, trying to win ten thousand dollar claiming races. So is that one of those things again? Obviously, you know, I mean these these forms are packed with so much information. Is that a shortcut for you, seeing that Godolphin wants to get rid of this horse? Does that mean that, you know, it's probably one that you're not going to have on your ticket? Oh, I would say this to you. We're doing this. Uh, you know, I, I ain't sitting here staring at race eight at Tampa Bay. Uh, that, you know, breaking it down this this much, you know, I mean, I, I, I took one pass at it. I know what I'm doing or I'm, what I would do. Um but, and this is this is the kind of thing where one of the things I'm really good at, and I'm not sound like an idiot. I'm you know I can I can lose with the best of them, but what I am good at is spotting. I'm very good at maiden races, um, first time starters, works and breeding, uh, and that's where the prices are. Horses that have never run before, and the other thing I could tell you is when a cheap horse is sitting on a good race because. The cheaper the horse, the fewer good races they actually can run. You know, they've only got so many good races in them. And I'm good at saying, yeah, here's here I see here are some of the telltale signs. Running lines works, past history trainer. This horse is actually sitting on a good race. There was one the other morning, it was like a minute to post, and I I I called a buddy of mine. Because in Vegas, we can't do anything. We can't bet this stuff <laughs> right now. It's crazy. But literally, it was two minutes to post, and it was a horse that was off a two-year layoff at Gulfstream. And uh, the horse clearly had an injury problem. And the horse was 18 to 1. They're going, I said, I'm telling you, this 11 horse is going to run a good race. And the horse won at 18 to 1. And it was the works. Uh, they, they, you know, I spotted a few things. And I go, this horse, no way. This, this horse should be 
four to one, and he won by three lanes. So I, I got a, I got a knack for knowing when the cheaper horses are are sitting on their good run. That's the problem on uh, Florida Derby Day, uh, Churchill Downs, Breeders' Cup. When you get into these high end races, you can make a case, a legitimate case for seven of the twelve runners in a race. You know what I mean? The tougher the race, the harder it is because so many of them have the ability to win. In the cheaper races, it's kind of a level playing, more of a level playing field. And then you look for the telltale signs. He's sitting on, they've built him to the point, today's his day to run a good race. And people aren't willing to forgive some of the crap in the ba- in the past. But if the sign is there that the good race is today and it's a level playing field, to me, that's where I make my money are the cheaper races. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. It, it's something I ran into in the Gulfstream Oaks over the weekend because uh, I'm looking at the form, I'm looking through everything, and I'm like, man, I think Swiss Skydiver has a shot. You know, Ken McPeak horse, he does pretty well with Phillies for the most part. I'm sitting there thinking, this horse has got a real shot. But the field felt so top-heavy, you know, with, um, was it Spice is Nice and uh, Tunnel is Shape, that I was just like, I, I don't see, I don't know if this horse can get there. Like, I think it's sitting on a good run. I think it has potential. I don't think it can get there. Wound up leaving it off the card for win in place. I had it in some exotics, and of course it wins the damn thing. But I, that, that was an example to me of somebody who's, you know, really a horse racing novice going, I think this one's got a shot in it, but I couldn't get past, you know, the shorter priced ones that just looked like they were going to be more consistent. Horse that wowed people. Uh, I don't, I'm going from memory now. I believe it was in the Fountain of Youth. Uh, total speedball. And everybody was saying it was a two-horse race. Or, or, or everybody was saying, tis the law at the Indian. And, you know, I, I jumped in and thought Independence Hall, because it had uh, trouble at Tampa Bay, blew a shoe, uh, would, would run a good race. But the one thing, and I think it was part of the discussion we had last week, is if you want to give yourself a real edge and a running start, if you can eliminate horses, well, I, tis the law. I absolutely use tis the law. I remember I used Governor Morris and I used Independence Hall. But the one thing I did, I chucked at the Indian. And that, people loved at the Indian. I said, that horse has no shot because he broke from the 12 hole. He was a speed horse. He had everything his own way in the previous race. And by the way, uh, you know, he had his head ripped off by. I believe I was at Independence Hall. Maybe had beaten at the Indian two races back. If it wasn't tis the law, but but what I'm, the point is, because of the post and the running style, and it was a different race than the previous race, and there was going to be other speed in the race. I just said I just can't envision at the Indian getting to the first turn, having the lead all to himself. I and and so completely threw a horse out that I I. Maybe you remember, but did he go off three to one, four to one, something like that? He was one of yeah. the favorites. And, yeah. But he, to me, he was a complete chuck and, you know, got that part of it right. And, you know, tis the law. Uh, the, the, the two I played on top were tis the law and Independence Hall, who kind of hung in the stretch. Uh, and then I, I forget the long shot. Wasn't there a long shot? Sawed him off. But uh, that, that's, a, that's another thing. Is if you can eliminate a horse or, or one of the biggest betting things you can do. Uh, is say, now oh, this horse is uh, six to five, uh, or you know, somebody's odds on. Oh, they love this horse. He, you know, he's the big favorite. I mean, you want to make a score is when you sit there and go, what? Why do they like this horse? What am I missing? If if, if you and the favorite only wins thirty three percent of the time, so I mean, where you can really make a score it, are in those races where you sit there and go, I'm convinced the fa- the favorite is phony. And if you can eliminate the favorite, maybe with conviction, I don't. I don't think this horse is hitting the board, and and then it happens all. You know, it happens twenty times a day or across North America. This favorite's phony. The, the public got this one wrong. Now, the the track that's closest to me is Thistledown. I mentioned this before. I love to go in the summer and have a couple beers and just enjoy. That's a dirt only track. I didn't realize just how many turf races there were on a daily basis across the country. And this eighth race here at Tampa Bay, like we said, is one and one sixteenth mile on the turf. Tabled ran a turf race last time out, three dirt races before that. 
Bitcoin Passions only race has been a turf race. Speaker at the number three, three straight turf races after three on dirt. The four alley-oop Johnny started on the dirt at Belmont, finished 38 and a quarter lengths behind, has run three turf races since, has been third, first, and fourth. So you've got some of these horses that have done a lot of running on turf, some that haven't done a lot of running on turf, but this is a turf race. So what does that mean to you in the handicap? Are you more likely to look at the turf horses versus the dirt horses? Or, you know, how does that sort of play out in your mind? Breeding aspect of it really comes into play in maiden races and early on in a horse's career. Say this horse is bred to do this. You know, once they've raced eight, nine times, I mean, okay, you've got you've got a database to work off. So the breeding becomes critical very early in their careers. And then it comes down to what what is a trainer's record with turf horses? Uh, is he good at turf sprints? Is he good at, at turf routes? Um, again, those stats for the trainer. It, uh, does the horse, you know, does does this, this guy 24% of the time, uh, you know, wins when a horse stretches from a sprint to a route or puts blinkers on or blinkers off? Again, I mean, we, there's so much that goes into it. But for the turf races, the one thing, and I learned this a lot of years ago, and uh, honestly, there are times, and it's harder when when you're doing it on TV. Here, I'll throw one before we get to turf. The post parade uh, is important. And a lot of times you don't have, you're sitting there and if you're watching TVG or whatever, they do show you the post parade. But if you're focused on a race, you know, let's see what a horse looks like. Sometimes a horse runs to his looks. But uh, the one thing I learned when you'd be at the track and it, they're going to be racing on a sloppy track or they're going to be racing on the turf is, okay, depending on the race, a, a horse with a thin, pointy hoof. <laughs> okay, now this is, the, this is how deep you can go with this stuff. Those horses go nuts in the slop. They, they they dig in, you know. They dig in and they glide over the surface. But for turf races, when you're looking, I mean, you want to see a horse, and and you want the horse hoof to look like a toilet plunger. I mean, uh, you want a big flat, a big round, fat, flat foot, and and, and, though, and and you you can see the difference, and you go, that's a turf horse. It, 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 you, it, you know, so you, you look at their feet, you look at their, their stride, you know, are they sore, uh, you know, or, or, oh boy, he's, he's on his toes. But I mean, as much, as much goes into it, you could just look at a horse as he walks by you. If he's got a pointy foot, oh, that horse would be good in the slot. Or if the horse has like a saucer for a hoof, you go, oh, that's a turf horse. That is uh, it's definitely next level analysis to be sure there, you know, and, and looking at some of the intricacies here. Uh, of horse here, and I'll, I'll throw one more at you though, the post parade. I was going to say this and I didn't, but the, I can't tell you how many times because it's a, it's a crummy day. It, it's a, you're, you're watching on TV and it's a soup kitchen. I mean, it, it's sloppy. It's a mess. And okay, there's the post parade. Nine horses go by. I'm Adam blindly. I do this. I go, are you kidding me? Really? Hey, look, okay. I grab the form, take a quick double check and say, okay, I'm in. If you are a day that it's it's a mess, and there's a nine horse field, and then the post parade, they go by, and the number seven is the only horse with a tied tail. I mean, the horse's tail is tied up in knots. Run to the window and bet that horse. I'm telling you, the trainer, the, 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 this trainer took the time to do this, and he's telling you he's got a shot. Because as little a thing is when they say if weight matters, we're bug riders, a kid that's a, the, the top uh, apprentice rider is one of the leading riders at every meet because he's getting a five or seven pound break in weight, you know, all season long, it matters. So if on a sloppy day, a guy ties a horse's tail during the course of that running, especially a route event, the, the tail by the end of the race, the horse has got picked up five pounds of mud on its tail. So if the guy takes the time to tie the horse's tail, he's telling you the horse has a shot because he thinks it'll make a difference that it ain't going to pick up five pounds of mud on the tail. And it, it's like he won or he ran second, 30 to one, only horse with a tied tail. It happens all the time. 
I guess one last thing to ask you about here with regards to the form, and you and I were talking about this before we started recording here. You know, in terms of of looking at past performances and looking at the strength of the field, there are some pretty telltale signs in terms of looking at the competition that these horses have gone up against in the past. Yeah, okay, Adam. Let's talk about Bitcoin Passion, uh, the number two. Maiden special weight, uh, the first race. One at first asking, that maiden classification's gone because uh, he won the race. Uh, the number, the, the difference is maiden special weight, that's like an allowance race. No one can take the horse from the trainer. Where the number three, uh, speaker it, won a maiden $16,000 race. No one claimed the horse, but someone could have claimed the horse. So now they're now going against winners for the first time. But then you go and, you know, as we break this down, this race down, uh, I believe by a country mile, the two horses in this race you have to consider are the two and the six. And the six is our country. And we're talking about an animal here. Uh, Second race was a winner at Saratoga on the turf, finished fourth in a respectable effort first time at Saratoga. The summer meet at Saratoga, you're talking the best horses in the country are there. Uh, Then the horse, after winning, went to the grade three with anticipation, real respectable run. Uh, finished fourth there, uh, finished third in the grade three pilgrim, moving to Belmont on the turf. And then they're going, listen, so this horse only had one win, but they thought enough of this horse as a two-year-old to put the horse in the grade one Breeders' Cup Juvenile at Santa Anita, which arguably would be the best race of the year for two-year-olds on the turf. So this horse, the last time we saw this her- horse, and he ran ninth in that race. Uh, but literally, uh, this horse is coming out of the best turf race of the year in 2019 and showing up at Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, you know, it's ridiculous. You got a maiden trying to win against winners for the first time. And the horse that I think he's got to try to beat is coming out of the toughest race of the year uh, on the turf for two year olds. And it's his first race as a three year old. And I will tell you this. This is absolutely one of my favorite betting angles all year long is in, in the ship has kind of sailed. We're almost at a point now by injury. Maybe some horses would be would still at this late date be coming off the shelf. But one of the best bets you can ever make is when you see at the beginning of the year, usually it's you know, January, February, March, a little in April, then it tails away. But when you see a horse's first race as a three-year-old, his horse is gonna has the potential to run off the sheet, so much better than it did before. Because two year olds are nuts; they're nut bars. They're 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 mental midgets. Uh, now they now they that's why schooling a horse, teaching a horse how to how to act at the gate to not get nuts and know that that this is it. it, it and you know, some of them are so good, some of them are crazy. Uh, they know it's race day. Some of them know it's race day. The others get to the starting gate, and they, they get all skittish and fractious and don't want to go in the gate. But as a three-year-old, you're more, they're bigger. They've, they've physically grown into their body. They're more mentally mature. And at the end of the year, that's why the Derby this year is going to be so interesting. Tis the law looks like a monster today. And if the Derby were run on May 5th, you know, uh, the, the, whoever would win the Derby, it's the same picture. You close your eyes and picture it. Every year, the Derby's the same thing. Horse draws off, wins by four, battle for second, couple horses battling for fourth, and you know, then you got 12 of them that are 18 lanes back. You know, Five or six of them separated themselves. But at the end of the year, the Kentucky Derby winner going through uh, the Triple Crown, then you go to the Travers, but at the end of the year, if you say, okay, the, the Derby winner's going to run in the Breeders' Cup Classic, all of a sudden, I can almost guarantee you, there would be another... And not necessarily, probably a horse that was on the Triple Crown trail. But there'll be a, a couple of three-year-olds that will really challenge the Kentucky Derby winner just because they're more mature and they're completely different animals than they were on the first Saturday in May. That's why this Kentucky Derby, if they run this on September 5th, is going to be amazing because you're going to have all the three-year-olds that are older three-year-olds and more mature and veteran horses. That's, I think the Derby's going to be great. But the angle is... First race is a three-year-old. The horse can improve by 10 lanes. And this horse, is, I mean, on paper, is a monster to begin with. And it's his first race as a three-year-old. I, 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 think, I think the two has a lot of talent. I think it's a two-horse race. 
I think Bitcoin Passion could Im- could run another big race, and to me is the only threat in the race for our country. Yeah, our country, the six horse here looks like in in that uh, in the juvenile turf it was it finished ninth, but it was only two and a half lengths behind the leader. That must have been one hell of a race. Oh, well, it's a great race, and oh by the way. Um, in that race, if you notice, it says, and I, I could go watch the replay and, and we could discuss it deeper, but it, it, in the running line underneath, it said the horse finished ninth by two and a half lanes, but it says the horse placed eighth through disqualification. So I, 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 you know, I'd have to look at the race, but the odds are this horse was absolutely flying. And if you look where it was, it, it, this horse was coming from off the pace. Th- this horse was absolutely flying and somebody wiped the horse out and you know through disqualification the horse got moved up to eighth but if that incident had not happened by the way that ninth place result by two and a half lanes if he's only two and a half lanes back and got placed eighth that something happened honestly this horse maybe was in a chance in with a chance to hit the board in that race well I know that, I'm, I... I'm saying that without watching the race but just reading them reading the form something happened um that, that, that compromised the horse's chances in the toughest race of the year. Well, I know what you and I are going to do right when we start recording. We're going to go and watch that juvenile turf from the Breeders' Cup last year and see exactly what happened here with the six in the eighth race at Tampa Bay Downs on Wednesday. Our country. Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline, as well as the Hockey Betting Podcast over on Bet Chris Canada. How can people check out all the stuff that you do, man? All right, buddy. We're still uh, hammering away with Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. In fact, as we were doing this, uh, just uh, he just reached out to me. Um, tomorrow we'll have Darren Dreger on, one of the premier uh, hockey insiders uh, in hockey. He's going to join us tomorrow on Vegas Hockey Hotline. Very much looking forward to that. Uh, find out what everybody's thinking about the possibility of stuff coming back on the hockey front. Still doing the Hockey Betting Podcast with our buddy Cam Stewart, which is worth a chuckle. And we uh, dished out grades for all the divisions. And we uh, the current one that's up, you can get on my Twitter, at Brian Blessing, or at BetChrisCanada.net. We gave out grades to the Pacific Division. If you're a hockey fan, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a really good listen. And Sportsbook Radio, all the top sportsbook directors, which is it's a tough time, Adam. I mean, this is a treat, a nice, fun diversion. We love doing this. You know, generally speaking, you know, this is great talking with you. Uh, Today, Tony Neville from Treasure Island, Tony Miller will be on board uh, from the Golden Nugget. And, you know, Chuck Esposito, Mike Lewis, Jay Cornegay. I'll leave somebody. uh, You know, the the best. Jeff Sherman's going to come on from the Superbook tomorrow. We're still talking. We're all looking forward. The NFL's been a nice diversion, bud. And numbers are popping up for the NFL drafts, regular season win totals. So we're all doing our part, bud. We keep going in hopes that we get back to normal soon. Yes, sir, we definitely do. Sportsbookradio.com, KSHP.com, the Hockey Betting Podcast, everything over on Brian's Twitter page, at Brian Blessing. Brian, appreciate your time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me, and we'll talk to you again real soon. All right, Adam. Hang in there, bud. There you go. There's Brian Blessing and at Brian Blessing on Twitter, sportsbookradio.com, KSHP.com, the Hockey Betting Podcast, Bet Chris Canada, all kinds of stuff if you want to hear Brian. And, of course, you can hear him every Tuesday here on Bang the Book Radio as well. Coming up on our Thursday edition of the Betters Box, I'll talk some more about breaking down Major League Baseball from a betting standpoint in hopes that at some point in time we actually get a baseball season. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again on Thursday.